Welcome to Off the Post. I'm Russ Cohen. We've got Anthony Mangione. And how are you? Doing all right, Russell, on this fine Sunday morning. How are you? I don't know. It's like, you know, we're getting through this 90 degree weather. Hopefully you're not sipping on your pumpkin spice coffee because it's really not fall yet. It's not pumpkin spice. Sorry. All right. Just making sure. Michael Jello, how are you? Already in reserve Uh, already, though. (laughs) Two weeks in a row, I proved that I can count, Russ. Well, I mean, that is a streak for you. And we have special guest Chris Johnston on TSN Insider. Chris, how are you? I'm doing great, guys. Looking forward to the season getting going here. Yeah, yeah, we all are. So, Chris, first thing, um, and maybe this, me being a prospect guy, I look at it differently, but I kept seeing a lot of um, articles being portraying the Jake Sanderson signing, long-term signing, as a gamble. And I don't know. I look at Jake Sanderson, and I, I see that he had a pedigree before he got into the league. He had a really good rookie season, you know, and a lot of other years could have won the Calder. Um, I see how he could skate. That's not going to change. I don't look at him as a gamble at all, but, you know, what's your view on that? Well, I think it, I guess it depends how we define gamble, right? I mean, every athlete's a human being. If you give someone an eight-year contract, we don't know what's going to happen. Injuries, lots of things can happen in, in eight years, and really it's nine years here because Jake Sanderson yeah. still has one more deal year on his entry-level deal. But I, but I agree with your premise in that, you know, if, if you're going to make a gamble, and, and again, I think every eight-year deal comes with some degree of gamble, even for the best player in the world, just because of all the things we don't know that can happen uh, over the course of an athlete's career. You know, this makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, we're, we're sitting here knowing that the salary cap next summer, uh, when, we're, when we're doing this podcast before next season, we're going to be talking about the impact of a crazy summer because the cap will have jumped up. We'll have seen more movement, I, I would suspect, league-wide. And that will probably continue, you know, unless, unless we get another pandemic on the horizon, which I'm hoping isn't the case. I mean, there's no reason to think that won't continue over the life of the contract of Jake Sanderson. And you're right. He's a young player who had a great rookie season. I mean, I don't see it as, as that crazy of a bet uh, from the Senators' end of things. We've seen them do this with other core players on their team. I think it kind of signals a, a pretty strong case for a team like Ottawa. And look, you know, I'm based up here in Canada. I think some different markets here are sensitive to this. But if you don't sign some of these players, I think, on their second deal long term in certain Canadian markets, there's a risk of them leaving, right? The, the, yeah. the Flames played hardball with Matthew Kachuk on his second contract. He does a three-year deal, and then he gets to the end of that, and he goes, you know what? I've got leverage here. Maybe I want to play somewhere else. And, and you know, I'm not predicting that Jake Sanderson would or wouldn't have done that, but I think this brings a level of security for the Senators franchise and knowing that, that they have – his rights really for the bulk of his twenties through the, what will probably be the best years of his career. I'm with him. There, there's risk in every contract, but I don't see as much risk here yeah. as maybe some others uh, were commenting on. And, and CJ, that seems to be the, the blueprint for Pierre Dorian. He got Norris and Stutzla and, and Brady Kachuk and Shabbat locked up on deals. Now he gets Sanderson. Uh, our colleague Pierre Lebrun brought it up with, uh, Kevin Adams, the Sabres general manager, regarding uh, Rasmus Dahlin and Owen Power. Uh, Power's represented by Pat Brisson. Uh, there's been talk about Dahlin and an eight-year extension throughout the summer, but it hasn't been consummated yet. And the question was whether the Sanderson deal would affect either one of them. I, I think it does because I think the Sabres want to get Power locked up as long as possible. But my my, my worry for the Sabres is that Power is going to do an Austin Matthews and do a creep, creep, creep towards the UFA and do shorter term deals. And that for their model, for their business model, I think is bad news. But what have you heard about the whole Sabre situation? Well, I do think that Darlene is, is likely to get an eight year deal. And, and, you know, some of the reports we've seen here is my understanding. They're accurate that the sides have made progress on those talks towards getting that done. And, and look, Dolene was another player, got bridged in, in his second contract. Now he's in a position. I mean, the Sabres, I think, have lots of data knowing how, how important he is. His career is trending in the right direction if you're them. I think that there, there's more comfort from the team's end, but they're going to have to pay him more now, right? I mean, it's going to be a higher AAV doing an eight-year deal now than it would have been a couple of years back. And I think that's why there's not a one-size-fits-all. I mean, I actually look at Buffalo and Ottawa, maybe both because they're trying to climb up in the Atlantic here and, and knock some of the more established teams above them out and, and become playoff teams. But they've, they've done things, you know, in a similar manner. I mean, the Sabres have given some of their key players long, long-term deals, maybe before it would seem that they've quote unquote earned them before they've maybe fully established themselves, but they've bet on the potential that they've seen. And so I think it would make sense to try to go as long as possible with power, but you know, there's also, 
you know, you get into a situation and, and we've seen lots of teams, you know, the Leafs in, in their first cycle uh, were like this too. There's only so many players you can pay at that level, right? And so one way to maybe make it a little easier is to give power a shorter term deal because you're not going to pay them presumably on a three or four or five year deal as much as you will on an eight. Um, but then of course he's in a great position for the next contract, assuming his career goes well. So I think that they're balancing that. Salim, though, I do expect would be an eight year deal. And, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if that's wrapped up before training camp opened. Chris, I wanted to ask you about the in, rather interesting situation that the Flyers or Philadelphia Flyers are finding themselves in with uh, Ivan Fedotov uh, in Russia. It's a, uh, you know, obviously we've the contract obviously was told last season uh, and obviously the IHF uh, found that the Flyers contract was valid. Yet Seska is obviously moving forward and made basically in defiance of the IIHF ruling uh, and is playing him right now. I wanted to ask you kind of how closely is the league monitoring its effect potentially in the future on the, on the transfer market? And if you think it's going to have any kind of effect, even though it's two separate franchises in Seska and Ska, whether or not it's going to have an effect on the Flyers' ability to bring over Matvey Michkov whenever that's going, whenever time that's going to be. Wow, that's a big question for a Sunday morning because there's, there's so <laughs> much here that there's just I mean it's 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 an important question. It's just that there's so much that that is even beyond the purview of the NHL. Even in this case, the Double IHF clearly their rules are being contravened with 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 Fedotov being played right now, and he's you know unfortunately we're talking about a player who's kind of a pawn in this bigger game and and you know we haven't really seen anything like this if you go back all the way when Alex Radulov left uh, Nashville and, and went back and was essentially not playing on his you know, basically the KHL wasn't honoring his NHL deal I mean really in the meantime we've had sort of relative peace where the two leagues maybe weren't always on the same page or um, you know there, there might have been some some backroom things that they didn't like about each other but they were honoring each other's contract that's that's what's changed now and I think as a result of that the league has no choice but to monitor the situation. I just don't know what they can do. And, and you know, if, if you're in the Flyers' front office, I mean, this Mitchkov situation is, is obviously vitally important for them. I mean, this, this is a pretty intriguing player, you know, with him not playing basically at all to start the season other than a few minutes in, in a recent game here. You know, you're going to be worried about his development. I don't know how much control they're going to have. And I, I don't really know what they can do. I mean, we, we've seen in the past, though, I mean, I think that, you know, it's almost forgotten, but if Denny Malkin basically, you know, bolted his, his KHL team at the time to Magnitogorsk to come and join the Penguins. I mean, maybe a situation like that pops up in the future for Mitchkov. I mean, I haven't heard that, but it, you just wonder if, there, if it comes to that. I mean, there's so many unknowns right now. I think that we're going to push now towards having best on best hockey again at some point here. I, I can't imagine Russia is going to be involved given, you know, the ongoing war in Ukraine, which, you know, maybe doesn't get as much attention for those of us based in North America, but certainly this is a, a huge story ongoing in, in Sweden and Finland and other places where a lot of NHL players are coming from. And so um, the best answer I can give you is we're all just waiting and watching. Um, certainly the NHL and the double IHF are a little more involved in that, but you know, I don't know what they can do if the players are in Russia right now. Yeah. All right. This question is going to come more from the greatest hits collection more like a Nickelback Greatest Hits than like a Metallica, to be honest. <laughs> there is no Nickelback um, Greatest Hits. Come on. <laughs> there is somewhere, Mike. Um, anyhow, to some there are. So the Arizona Coyotes, Chris. Uh, you know, the if this were happening with this kind of team playing in a college location in almost any other league, it would be laughed about all the time. But I think because it's the NHL, everybody's kind of like – outside of the NHL circle, they're just kind of like, all right, whatever, whatever. But, you know, we who cover it can't imagine – we don't see any kind of end resolution here other than Arizona State re-upping so they can continue their plot to try – their ploy to try and get some land somewhere. They haven't spent any money on land. They're just writing out, you know, whatever that is, a certificate of, yeah, I might buy your land, whatever they call that. And so my question to you is – do you think we're going to see any kind of resolution this year, or do you think it's just going to keep getting extended? I do finally think this is the year where there has to be resolution. You know, I, look, we, we know that the NHL wants this to work. I mean, there's no mystery. I mean, just, just look right. at the, the facts and, and how long this has gone on and the various forms it's taken on. I mean, the league is not anxious as much as there's been lots of speculation to move the team. I, I don't think that's what the NHL wants, but they, but they recognize – even if it isn't being mocked to the degree it might in another, you know, sport or if it was more high profile, that, that it can't go on forever. I mean, from a business standpoint, 
uh, they're making the best of things. But really, that, that team needs to be an arena where they can have a chance to make money, have a chance to truly build up a fan base. I mean, I, I am actually sympathetic to, to the hockey fans in, in that area, too. I, I think that they're just not given a chance here really to, to show their best because of a lot of factors that have gone on there. You know, there's, I think a little bit of fatigue too. That's probably why it's not talked about as much. I mean, right. I was early in my career when they had, when they had that bankruptcy case, right. When they were nearly yeah. bought out of bankruptcy and moved to Hamilton. And now I got this gray in my beard. So, I mean, it, yeah, it's yeah. been going now, were on. You watching, were you watching online on those early internet feeds? Like I was, I you remember those where people were going up and they were proclaim, proclaiming their love for the coyotes in front of the judge. It was pretty wild. I, I was, yeah. Get this, I was actually down covering some of those court cases in the day, oh, wow. which, you know, early in my career was pretty good because it felt like every six weeks, you know, I had a chance to go to Phoenix and yeah, you know, yeah. it, was really, it was it was pretty interesting. But, you know, unfortunately, I can't believe there's been no resolution since. But look, they, they feel like they have a piece of land now. <laughs> you know, I really thought the Tempe thing was going to work. I, I actually do believe that that that. I mean, I don't live in Tempe. I'm not a taxpayer. So they have a referendum that the people don't want it. I mean, that's, that's, it is what it is. But I, I thought that that was going to finally be the breakthrough. I might be in the minority here. I believe that the Coyotes could be really successful in Arizona. I, I actually do believe it's a good market for the league if they can get the right building, but that's a huge if. And it hasn't happened for years and years and years. And now we're a decade in. And if you don't have the right building, eventually they're going to have to go somewhere where they have one. I just want to scrub the name Redfield T bomb from my memory banks. That's it. It's over. He, he was funny for a judge, man. He actually was, he made that, those things pretty entertaining for, for those of us watching. Okay, Curtis, uh, time for the obligatory William Nealander question. Um, I have been railing since, since June that th there's one of three scenarios that plays out one, the Leafs sign him to a long-term extension. I, if it's eight years, probably north of nine million dollars. There are some people who don't believe he's worth that, but that you know that put that by this, put that to the way to the side. Um, the other uh, option is to trade him either before the beginning of the season or before the trade deadline if you're convinced that he's not going to sign. The third option is keep him as an own rental and then let them walk, and all you get is the cap space, which isn't a lot. It's a little less than $7 million. It's it's a significant amount, but it's not like you're letting a $10 million player walk. The comments from Brad Treliving that he made at the, the GM coaches meeting in Chicago seem to lean toward, well, we'd like to get him on an extension, but if this is going to play out throughout the season, we're just going to go with him. I think that's the worst scenario. I think letting him walk for nothing – after this season is is in a, 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 just a bad move by Trilliving. It's just a repeat of what happened with Johnny Goudreau in Calgary. What is your read on this whole situation? Well, I certainly don't expect them to be traded. And, you know, there's a lot of time between now and March when the deadline will happen. So, so maybe at some point in these intervening months, William Elander does say the least, look, I, I'm not going to sign an extension. And then it's a different conversation or it's a different set of decisions, I think, for the front office. But as long as they feel like he wants to stay in Toronto, and, and I've heard consistently, I know some people pretty close to William, that he really does want to be a Maple Leaf. I mean, for him, this is about fair. And, you know, he's seen that the, the, the players on the team above him and sort of in the pecking order have a pretty wide gap, right? He's made, as you mentioned, Mike, about $7 million bucks on the cap. You know, Austin Matthews has been at 11.6. Mitch Marner has been just under 11. Obviously, John Tavares is at 11 as well. And if you look at his performance relative to those players, it's probably not a $4 million gap. I think that that's, that's almost as simple as this is if you're in William Melander's shoes. I mean, he, he, he wants to be part of the team, but he thinks that he deserves to be closer to those guys. He's not asking, of course, to be above them or anything like that. I think he's realistic about his position, but he's performed consistently well in terms of points anyway in the playoffs, even when sometimes the, the other big guns on the team haven't. And he's coming off a 40-goal, 80-plus point campaign. And so that's really where it sits. I, I don't know what the, the new front office is going to decide. I don't know if they just eventually bite the bullet and sort of pay it, maybe stretch themselves a little thin to pay him. Um, but this is still a big year for the Leafs, right? I, I don't see them just giving him away. I don't think the trade market, uh, as much as they've ever explored it, has ever, there's never been anything I think that's even made them have to be like, hmm, do we do this? You know, there's not been a, a way for them to get better while making this trade. And so he's got the, I mean, he's got all the leverage. As any player, that's performing well, that's going into the final year of his deal, 
um, you know, he's, he's going to have to decide. But I, I think that there's going to be another push here, Mike, to, to try to get him signed. You know, yeah, I think they're going to sign him. That's honestly, that's what I felt for a while now. But we'll see. Yeah, well, I, I just don't know where the number ends up. I mean, we know what the range is here. Uh, you know, you're saying north of nine. I'm sure he's still asking for ten. Is there a is there a compromise that they can find? I mean, I I, I think either way, you're 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 right. My my hunch tells me he gets there eventually as well. But for him to draw this out, it probably works pretty well in his favor because I think there's more and more pressure on the team to make a hard decision. And and let's say we get to March and he hasn't signed, but the Leafs are in a great spot. I it's just hard to imagine them trading him. And and you know he's. You know, at some point, I guess they have to have that real discussion. I don't, I don't sense that a lot's been happening on this front, Mike, in, here in, in recent weeks. Right. But, you know, now everyone's back in September. You know, we're seeing a number of teams, you know, try to find their players, I think, before camp. And I think Nylander falls into the same category. Chris, speaking of players that are entering the final year of their deal, I mean, in Philadelphia, we have Carter Hart right now, who's uh, going to be going into RFA status by this offseason. Flyers goaltending situation is an interesting one right now. I mean, they have, they recently, they made, obviously, when they made uh, the trade with St. Louis, they also acquired Cal Peterson, who's got two years left at $5 million. Uh, they recently signed uh, Sam Urson to an extent to uh, his extension. So that's good. And he's, this is a player I, you know, based off of comments from John Tortorella, he likes a lot in Urson. And then, of course, just recently they just signed uh, Alexei Kolosov, who's going to be on a loan uh, to Minsk before he comes over. So I guess with a lot of goalies currently sort of in the system and kind of chipping and making their way up um, and hard kind of being on an RFA, uh, coming up on his RFA de- at the end of his R- uh, going up to RFA status. What is this? Uh, what do you how do you view his future in Philadelphia? Do you think he's going to be staying the extension moving on? I, I think it's not a guarantee he's staying. And, and, you know, if we had gone back two or three years, I, I, I would have sounded crazy, right? He was the franchise goalie. Yeah. He was what the whole program was built around, but a lot's changed. The, the, the front office has, has rebuffed, you know, they, they've already traded out some players. I, I don't think that they're necessarily going to stop at the guys that were moved in the off season by Danny Breer. I, I could see more of a sort of rebuild type of mode taking form and, and, you know, I think the real question is when is Philadelphia looking to, to really be a playoff team again? I, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but it, it's probably a couple of years down the road. Uh, and if you're having to make decisions on a player like Carter Hart, you know, it, they could get to the point where they're going to trade him. I, I don't think, you know, there was a, I think there was a report in June or July, if I'm not mistaken, that they were sort of on the verge of something. I, I, don't, I don't believe it ever got that close. Mm-hmm. But, right. you know, obviously, you know, I could see a, a set of circumstances playing out here where they do – end up pursuing that a little bit more aggressively. And so, you know, I would say that this is probably a, an important year, as, as strange as it sounds, because I don't see Philadelphia as a team try to challenge for the playoffs, but, you know, for Hart to, to, to sort of find his place or, or not uh, in Philadelphia. But I look, at, if, if we're handicapping it, I'd say it's more likely than not um, we're talking about this player being moved probably a year from now. But, you know, it still kind of hangs in the, in the air a little bit. And, and I think a lot of it is just the uncertainty around anyone in the organization that isn't under a certain age. And he's kind of on the line of that age as right. we're talking now. See, CJ, just to finish off here, um, Russ and I will be having a uh, battle on Monday night because his jets are playing my bills. And I'm trying to try to keep you and Anthony separated here because he's a big Eagles fan and you're the Cowboy. How, how, how enthused are you about the Cowboys this year and their chances of winning a Super Bowl for the first time since they beat the bills? I'm ready to be hurt again. You know, I, I'm one of those Cowboys fans, honestly. Like, I see people make fun of Cowboys fans, and, and I totally get it. I'm not even defending Cowboys fans, but I'm never that hopeful. I always assume it's going to end badly. Same I, I, don't, I don't – I mean, I know they're going to be a decent team, uh, but I certainly – I'd be shocked if they won the Super Bowl. But, you know, I still, I still buckle in every Sunday or Monday or Thursday and watch the games, and, and it brings me – some amount of joy occasionally, but I, I'm not feeling that great about their season. If I'm being honest, you, uh, I have some, so you basically in this case with you and Pierre Pierre's, it's like the yin and yang for, for cowboy fandom. Yeah. I think Pierre's getting even so beaten positive. down a little bit too, I don't know. <laughs> but I'm, I'm definitely negative. Pierre's old enough. And this isn't a shot at the change, but he's old enough to remember those super bowls. Like I wasn't around for the Cowboys ever being that good. I mean, they've had some pretty good regular yeah, seasons true. in my time, that's but true. I, I haven't really been a fan when they've had any degree of success. It's, it's just been heartbreaking. So, I mean, look at, that's what sports is though, too. I mean, yeah. I, I'm a big Blue Jays fan in baseball. And of course they won the world series in 93, but I was a kid then. And it's been a lot of crap. Well, since then. So, junior high school, Chris, that was a heartbreaking uh, moment for me. There you go. Chris, so like it's, 
this is the way it's supposed to be, right? I mean, you're not supposed to have much joy uh, with I, your sports I, teams. I lived through four straight Super Bowl losses, and I I did forget the, that uh, that Barry Switzer won uh, won a Super Bowl with the Cowboys against Pittsburgh after they beat the Bills. But Which I think maybe, is part of the problem here for yeah, the maybe Cowboys. Maybe use up all your luck yeah. with Barry Switzer winning a Super Bowl. I mean, that was. <laughs> but I'm pumped for the NFL season. I will say it's, it's my favorite. It's my favorite thing, other than the, you know, in sports, other than the work I do in, with the NHL. Like it's, I got Josh Allen on my fantasy team, Mike. So I'll be pulling for the Bills to some degree this year, anyway. Okay. <laughs> well, he's going to get a lot of sacks against them this week. So sorry. Anyhow, <laughs> thanks for coming on, Chris. We appreciate it. Everybody should follow him on Twitter. He's definitely a TSN insider and all around good guy. Thanks, Chris. Good to be with you guys. Be well. Thanks, thanks Chris. I appreciate it. All right. And I know you're so, all rooting for the Eagles this week because they're playing the Patriots, so there. Yeah, yeah. Of course I'm rooting for the Eagles. The one time I can root for them. Um, yes, yes, but, but, but let me just say this because I, t- I told Russ this, and um, I, 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 I don't want to slam anybody on, on social media because I, I try not to do that. But um, I really wanted to slam – A bunch uh, of text messages, though. <laughs> yeah, yes. I really wanted to slam former ESPN uh, um, honk – Bill Simmons, who now the, with the ringer, where, where he predict, where he predicted both the Jets and the Bills to miss the playoffs, and that the Patriots would make the playoffs. You've lost all credibility when you pick that. That I mean, okay, he won six Super Bowls, but he's past it. Belichick and that team is not very good. If he beats the Eagles today, everybody will be lauding him again. No, but today, you know, here's the weird thing about today, though. The weather's awful. If it becomes a sloppy running game and it's a close game, game one of the NFL season, anything can happen. Like, you know, so I wouldn't even put that much stock into it unless they shut him out. If they shut out the Eagles, fine. Then oh, Mike yeah. Will have it. This, this city will be ready to uh, – to Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, bad things will happen. Um, there's no greased poles this time of year. Anyhow, <laughs> let's, uh, <laughs> let's move on. What do you, I want to know what your guys' feeling is. I'll give mine, too, on the – Joel Quenville, Stan Bowman tribunal that happened recently in front of all of their, you know, compatriots or contemporaries with Gary Bettman waiting to sort of make a decision. This was weird. Like, I I don't I don't understand what it's going to matter if you get a consensus of the coaches that say, yeah, he could come back. Like, I mean, I I didn't understand it. Honestly, It's a fraternity, too. That's the thing. It's just like. I don't yeah. expect any of the coaches to to to, to not like right. look at him and say he's de- uh, to me they're going to look at the situation and say well based on what he knew or whatever he's he's done his punishment and right. you know, he's a provenly he's a proven you know really good, great head coach that's and that's going to be the pitch in that circumstance that's and, and that's to be in my mind that's expected so then it comes down really to whether or not that you know they're going to have to weigh out how much blowback they're going to get. And again, the, I hate to say this: the further out you get from it, by very nature, yeah, the less you the, the the less you see, and you will get some reaction to it. But yeah, I think in all likelihood, there's I think we know that the end result. I think will likely be here. Yeah, but and I said this to Russ when when I heard that this was happening. The optics of the fact that this happened in Chicago. Where where the GM and the and the coaches meetings were, yeah. I think you know maybe was lost on some people, but I, you know no, I mean like okay, this is where everything happened with uh, with with Kyle Beach and mm. and and and, and you, know, you know maybe in New York it should have been done in the NHL offices in New York maybe right. yeah that's really where it should have happened. happened maybe something that kind of bites them in the rear end and it should have been a neutral site. For yeah. lack of a better term, yeah. and you know okay, what does a mea culpa in front of their colleagues and compatriots what does that do i mean i mean okay i'm sure they have friend they have, they had friends who are coaches and friends who are general managers and they were supportive of this but it wasn't about that it was about gary bettman making a decision of whether it was okay for them to come back and stan bowman interviewed for the calgary job there, right. were, there were rumors of joel quenville being in the mix for what the rangers the leafs <laughs> fired yeah. Sheldon Keith. So really it's almost like a shadow campaign and this is like bringing it out in the open. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, whatever they're going to, you know that they're going to get jobs again when a scumbag like Bill Peters gets a job 
anywhere in professional professional yeah. or minor yeah. league hockey, you know that you know that, uh, Quenville. That, that was a, such a su- that that situation was such a the whole thing just you want to talk about something that puts a bitter taste in your mouth when you're when you're watching this and knowing full well that this is just theater. That basically his reaction. Yeah. I mean, and then you find out. Oh, I reached out to him. I'm like literally yeah, a week yeah. before you. Because you know you had this job lined up, and that's when you right. finally didn't do it. And it not, not number one, you don't do it through you. You do it through an intermediary. You don't do it directly. Right. right. Gee, I wonder no, I agree. who he was. So now we'll talk about Mike Babcock, who I kind of think is doing it better in the sense that he in better. his, in he his better. yeah, <laughs> in his uh, listen, I'm not going to support him. I'm just saying I think. What he said the other day is better in the sense that he was like, listen, if you feel like I'm going over the line, tell me, you know, if he's he's telling his players that. So I feel like at least he's sort of creating a line of communication that never existed before between him, him and his players and definitely certain players. So I feel like that's some progress. I'm not going to give him plaudits here. But I- again, this is just you can't – he can't – there's no way he can be successful in the NHL in 2023 – doing it the way he was doing it. Yeah. It's just not going to work. Well, there has to be lines. And now there are certain non-negotiables that coaches should have with regard to how they want players to play. Right. But in terms of transparency and communication, I think if you're trying to prove to everybody that, you know, you're, this is Babcock 2.0 or three, 2.5, whatever. Yeah. These are things that you, it's, I expect that he has to do. Right. I don't, I mean, I don't give him any sort of plaudits or lauded. You know, anybody's like, "Oh, look what he's doing." No, you're supposed to do this. Congratulations. Welcome to the. Welcome to. Welcome to 2023 NHL. Well, the question is, is whether this is just Kabuki theater and and he's putting a nice shine on things. I've learned my lessons and this and that. Does that I mean, I believe him. I don't. I don't have a reason not to believe yeah. him. Oh, okay, that's that's what I was gonna say. I have, yeah. I don't have a reason not to believe him, but it's sort of trust. But verify. It's like, I mean, yes. I, I, you know, if you're starting to hear whispers out of the Columbus locker room that he's shaming Kent Johnson or, or, or Adam Fantilli, then you know that all he did was, you know, put, put, put on an act for the media and they went back to being, you know, the 800 pound. Uh, he has uh, to be abundantly aware of the fact that everybody, that people now, he, he does oh, not. Yeah. At this point now, the advantage he had previously was his success as a coach. It's been a long, it's been a little while since he's been in an NHL locker. It has, and yeah. he, at, at this point now, he whatever, I guess, benefit the doubt he would have gotten in the past because of his previous history as a coach and his success as a head coach. Right. That's that. That's no, that's all gone. You're right about that. That's completely gone. So, and it will get. It, it will. I don't care if it's. It will get reported. It will get out. If it would be the previous time. There's no question it would this time around. All right. Um, one little item that came up, but of course it definitely um, puts a harpoon in the hearts of some Ranger fans with Tyler Mott signing in Tampa for 800,000. Like this is a typical um, signing that causes like ripples in the, um, in the Twitter verse, but also with Ranger fans, like, when they're they texting each other and I stuff, because it. they all like, like Tyler Mott. I get yeah. it. Now Mott did come up short last year uh, in the postseason, like a lot of Rangers did. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, it okay, and and I don't know the the backstory on the whole Josh Archibald termination contract. It sounds like there's some sort of health crisis. Um, you know, maybe we don't know the, and it's none of our business. He just decided yeah. he so step away. Not going to play, and that was yeah. the opportunity for for Tampa to bring in Mott. And uh, oh, but but I mean Mott, we we we've recognized that Mott a couple times with the Rangers, and even to a lesser extent with with Ottawa has stepped in and been an effective depth forward. And you know that's all that Tampa needs is an effective. De- you know they, they they they've got some of the best top six forwards, and really where they needed to fill holes is to have effective third and fourth line guys. And he's going to do a decent job at eight hundred thousand dollars a year. So they Julian Breesbaugh were. were, were uh, recovered nicely, but with that signing, I would say this also with Mod again, and we have to keep this in mind in terms of management. I, we put fans fall in love with death players. They do. They stay, they love that, but you have to be careful in terms of even on a one-year deal overpaying 
a depth forward in this circumstance. And I know Larry Brooks stated that the report was is that he was looking at for two million. And in that respect, yeah, that's definitely would be in my mind, you know, because I, I like Mott. I've watched him plenty. Um, but it's an over it would be an overpayment. It would have been an overpayment for the Rangers in this circumstance. I think in Tampa, plus you'd count for taxes and everything else, that number, that eight hundred, you know, some thousand dollar deal has a little bit more, carries a little bit more after taxes and for him anyway. So he goes to Tampa, keeps himself obviously in cup pursuit uh, as a support player for for a team that, you know, I, I still think I know everybody's, you know, waiting to, you know, basically say it's the end of the lightning, uh, end of the lightning, but um, I still think they're going to be around. I still think they're going to be a problem for teams. So, and Mott's, I think, someone that will help them, certainly in the short term. Okay, uh, just to finish off the show, um, just a, a rant on the uh, the pump the, the pumpkin spice. Uh, Anthony, it's like I, I go to a farmer's market in, uh, in suburban Buffalo, mm-hmm. or actually in downtown Buffalo, and everything – Everything is pumpkin. What's the date? What's the date, Michael? Uh, September September 10th. 10th. Okay. Once you hit September, it's the fall month. I mean, my, I've always said, and I'm going to repeat this ad nauseum. My issue is always starting this stuff and starting this stuff mid August. But we get it. We also have a group of people I'd refer to as the cult of fall. I love my sister in law. She's probably one of the high priestesses of that. She hates the weed. Um, And in this circumstance, it's, I, I find, I'm like, I have a rule of not touching anything along those lines until we're of course the funny part is we've been in a massive heat wave here in philadelphia in this area of late so it's like come on you know it, 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 i don't even want to touch it until the temperature. yeah i mean it's been really hot it's been hot so i don't want to you know i don't want to you know touch it until uh it's until it's uh appropriate time. yeah it's it's over. I mean, I agree. Yeah, Russ, I know. Yes, we know. <laughs> For the 90, um, 90 yeah, I, first time, we know. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, You're not stopping you, Dave Russ. You're not stopping my campaign, you. Well, then stop making the stupid products. I'm with Mike. <laughs> I'm not stop making the stupid products. They're not serving you. They're serving I mean, us. But it's 94 degrees. Like, they're going to strap Russ down in a gurney and inject. I get it, but it's ni- when it's 94 degrees. Oh. Uh-oh. I think we, I think we lost Russ. He's, he's Stay away from pumpkins when it's 94 degrees. That's my that's my message here. Okay. Uh, all right. I'll 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 end the show. Uh, thanks uh, for to – All right. Us. That's it for all the posts. <laughs> Go ahead, Russ. <laughs> that's it for off the post. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, having a little trouble here, but that's it for off the post. We'll catch everybody next time. Take care, everybody. Bye.